Welcome back, everybody, to another week of Sunday School here at the Lighthouse Church of the Nazarene in Moravia, Iowa, where we are going through the book of Job. This week, we're in Job chapter 39. Now, last week, in Job chapter 38, we finally heard from God after 35 weeks of just hearing from Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu. We, we finally heard from God. And what did God say? What did he say to Job? He said, who is this? who darkens counsel by words without knowledge. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will ask you and you will answer me. Isn't that interesting what God said? He, he didn't come out and tell Job everything that was going on. He didn't explain to Job like, well, you know, I was making a bet with the devil and uh, my odds were very good on you, Job. So I had to take this bet. God didn't also explain to Job how everything's going to get restored double by the end of this book here, now everything's going to be okay. What did God do? He basically humbled Job and said, hey, if you're so smart, how about you tell me all these things? How about you explain to me all these things in creation in the universe? Surely you know if you're so smart. Now, I have to say this. The first three verses in uh, Job 38 are probably some of my favorite passages of scripture in the entire Bible. And, and why is that? It's because anytime I start to feel sorry for myself or if I start to question the goodness of God, I can read Job 38. And then I think, you know what? Who am I to question God? God knows what he's doing. So, but we have to ask ourselves this. Why did God respond to Job the way he did? Why didn't he explain everything that's going on? Why didn't he tell him what's going to happen and how everything's going to be okay? Why did God respond to Job the way he did? Well, I, I got a couple things here. First one was to humble Job. Now, you might ask, did Job really need humbled? I don't know. I wish I sure wouldn't have thought so. But but God says this in the Bible. It's in Isaiah chapter 29. And then Paul quotes it again in uh, 1 Corinthians 1. But he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The Bible tells us that, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, uh, the Bible also tells us that God has made the wisdom of this world foolish. Isn't it interesting that a lot of the times the, the most educated people are the people that have the least regard for God? Now, this isn't always the case. Um, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was a Christian. The, the man who invented calculus, he said, no, it's impossible for there to not be a God. So, but a lot of times worldly wisdom goes against godly wisdom. And I do think that God had a, God had this. He, he had to humble Job. Now, going back to worldly wisdom, isn't it interesting how often textbooks have to be revised and they have to bring out, you know, a, a new edition because we had to revise the old one because things have changed? This book right here, thousands of years old, has it ever need to have been revised? No, not once. It's always right. So the first reason that God said what he did was to humble Job. But I also want to say this. If Job needed a little dose of humility, I can promise you that you and I also need a major dose of humility. I'll say that. Um, another reason why God responded to Job the way he did, it's to show that you and I aren't always going to know what's going on with everything. You and I aren't always going to be able to explain everything that's going on in the kingdom of God. With some things with God, we are on a need to know basis. And there are some things that we just don't need to know. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord. But those things which have been revealed to us belong to us and to our children. Um, Isaiah 55 is another verse that I use quite a bit, probably too much. But, you know, God says, my ways are not your ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. Uh, we aren't always going to know what's going on with God. We aren't always going to be able to explain everything. But we also have to say this. Who are we to question God? And the third reason why I think that God responded to Job the way he did is this. Even on our best days, we fall short. Even on our best days, we fall short. I feel like Job responded pretty well to his calamity, really. Loses everything in one day, his ten children's all his worldly goods. And what does he say? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He loses his health. His wife tells him, just curse God and be done with this all. And what does he say? He says, shall we accept good from God and not evil? I know for a fact that Job responded better than I would have. And yet he still 
by the end of this book is going to repent and ask for forgiveness. Um, the book of Isaiah tells us this, that it's in Isaiah 64, says, all our filthiness or all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Um, even on our best days, we will fall short no matter how good we think we are. I think it's the book of Galatians that says, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Job responded better than you and I would have in, the, in his calamity. And yet still, by the end of this book, he's fallen on his face and he's asking for repentance from God. Now, last week in Job chapter 38, God basically gave Job a science test, did he not? He asked him about earth creation, about how the universe works. This week in chapter 39, God's going to bring it down a level and he's going to talk about the animal kingdom. It's, it's almost as if he has to dumb it down a little bit for Job and say, you know, if you can't understand this stuff, maybe you can understand this. This should be easy for you, but Job, even you can't understand this stuff right here. So we're in Job chapter 39. God's going to be talking about some of the animal kingdom here to Job. Let's get out our Bibles. Let's follow along. Job chapter 39, verse 1. This is God talking to Job. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goat bears young? Now, the wild mountain goat would have been up in the mountains, would have been hard for people to study or see because it was so far up in the mountains. But he's, God says, do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? I, isn't it so interesting that God designed wild animals to give birth at a time when their young can survive? I know around here, the, the deer, they give birth to their young um, right towards the end of May and early June, right at a time when the weather's good for them, when the coyotes and all the predators have enough food, they're not up. You know, what would happen if God had designed the deer to give birth in the middle of winter? All the young would have froze to death. You know, who, who designed them like this? God did it, and he did such a great job. Verse 2, can you number the months that they fulfill, or do you know the time when they bear young? Hey, Job, how long is the gestation period of these goats? You're so smart. Now, um, we know that what a woman's gestation period is nine months, so we say, I know a cow's 283 days. A lot of farm kids know the gestation period of a pig just because it's, it's easy to remember. It's three months, three weeks, three days. But what's God asking Job? Hey, you're so smart. You should know these things. How long is their gestation period? God knows these things because he designed them that way. Verse three, they bow down. They bring forth their young. They deliver their offspring. Their young ones are healthy. They grow strong with grain. They depart and do not return to them. What, what God is explaining all this like, hey, these animals, they do it all fine. And guess what? They do it without any intervention from man. You had nothing to do with this. You know, we think we are so special that if we're not there to do something, it's just not going to get done. It's basically that question, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, well, how prideful is that? You know, if a man is not there to hear it, does it make a sound? Of course it does. All these things go on without our knowledge and without us knowing about them. But we can also say this because of all this. If God takes care of the animals, Will he not also take care of you and I? Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, uh, it's Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to turn there real quick. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Then I'm going to skip a little bit to verse 31 where Jesus says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father already knows the things that you have need of. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be taken care of. Jesus is saying, you know, these birds, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet I take care of them, and are you not of more valuable than they? You, know, you and I are more important than birds. God is going to take care of us. Let's keep going here. Verse 5, who sets the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the onager? Now, now, this donkey called the onager is a donkey that has never been domesticated. It, it's the wild desert donkey. It, it's still around today. It's aggressive. It's independent and it's untamable. It can survive in the harshest of climates. And, and God's asking Job about it. Now, it's interesting. Does anybody know who in the Bible is referred to as a wild donkey of a man? I'll give you a couple seconds. 
Ishmael. It's in Genesis chapter 16, verse 12, I believe. But uh, God told Hagar, Ishmael, he, he will be a wild donkey of a man, untamable, aggressive. You aren't going to be able to control him. And that's what God's referring to this donkey right here. So why did God make a donkey so untamable? He, even lions and tigers can be domesticated, right, and trained. But not this donkey. Why did he make him like that? Verse 6, whose home I have made the wilderness and the barren land his dwelling. You know, this donkey, he can survive out in the barren land. He doesn't need any help. He scorns the tumult of the city and does not heed the shouts of, dri of the driver. And the range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. Now we're going to go to another animal in verse 9. Will, will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Now, if you're reading an old King James Version right here, it's actually going to say unicorn. This is where they say, well, there's unicorns in the Bible. It's old King James translation of this right here, the wild ox. And I had to look this up. The, the Greek is monokeros, beast with one horn, beast with a horn. That's why they took it to unicorn, beast with a horn. But it's probably an auroch. It's actually mentioned nine times in the Bible. It became extinct in the 1600s. But that's who this, what this wild ox is right here. Verse 9, will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed by your manger? Verse 10, can you bind the wild ox in the furrow with ropes, or will he plow the valleys behind you? Hey, Job, can you tame this wild ox? Can you get him to plow for you? God's saying, you, you might as well be plowing with a rhino, because it's not going to happen. Verse 11, will you trust him because his strength is great, or will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain or gather it to your threshing floor? Now we're going to go to another animal in verse 13. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but her wings and pinions are like the kindly storks. Now this is another instance where the old King James actually takes this to peacock right here. I believe every other translation I looked up uses the word ostrich. But what God's asking him, you know, God doesn't ask any Job actually any questions in this paragraph. He's just going to describe the ostrich to him. Verse 14, for she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. When she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and the rider. Now, now this is actually kind of interesting. Verse 17 here, God says, I deprived her of wisdom. God did not give the ostrich wisdom, but do you know what he did give her? The ability to run fast. You know, when it says when she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and, and its rider. Ostriches can run faster than most horses. Um, I know at Prairie Meadows, they actually have ostrich races sometimes, which are probably pretty fun to watch. But uh, here he says, I did not give the ostrich wisdom. Do we know where wisdom comes from? It's Proverbs 2, 6. It says, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes understanding and knowledge. The book of James tells us if any of us lack wisdom, that we should ask for it from God. You and I, we lack wisdom. We need God's wisdom in everything we do. But uh, I think what God's saying here with the ostrich, you know, even the animal world doesn't always make sense. Why, why did God make a winged bird that was flightless and, you know, that was so dumb that sometimes it just leaves its young or doesn't do anything for them? But even the bird like this, God still takes care of them. They still proliferate and move on. Do they not? Let's keep going here. Verse 19, have you given the horse strength? Now, this is this is a war horse that was known, that was known for its courage. Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a lo locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He gallops in the clash of arms. He mocks at fear and is not frightened, nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and javelin. He devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet is sounded. At the blast of the trumpet, says he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and snorting. This horse was known for being fearless. It was characterized by his fearlessness in war. Verse 26, one last animal here, the hawk or in the eagle. Verse 26, does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest in high places? 
these hawks and eagles, they're, they're birds of prey. And it's interesting that God didn't even overlook one detail in making these birds. Cause it just says, you know, that they build their nests up on high, but what did it also, God also gave them keen eyesight so that they can see from far distances. It, what would happen if they built their nests on high, but had a uh, poor eyesight and couldn't see anything. It wouldn't work, would it? Verse 27, does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? On the rock, it dwells and resides on the crag of the rock and on the stronghold. From there, it spies out the prey. Its eyes observe, its eyes observe from afar. Its young ones suck up blood. And where the slain are, there it is. Now, we got through Job chapter 39, where God was just asking Job about the animals. What was the point of all this? Why did God bring this all to Job's attention? Well, I think God wanted Job to know that, hey, I made this world to operate so perfectly without you. Maybe you can trust that I know what I'm doing. If God takes care of all these animals, will he not also take care of us? And I think that's the lesson for us. God knows what he's doing. We can see it throughout all creation. God knows what he's doing. You and I, we can put our trust in him. All right, only a couple more chapters in the book of Job, and we're going to be all the way through it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Bye.